So currently I'm going through my prospect rankings because we're at that midseason point. So I'm shuffling things up. I've already done my quarterback and my tight end midseason rankings. And now it's time to switch to the defense. And I'm going to give the hog molly some love. So here are my top 10 defensive interiors in the 2025 NFL draft. At number 10, I got Jordan Burke out of Oregon coming to six foot six, 290. Five pounds, former five-star recruit from the 2020 recruiting class, initially went to South Carolina, played there for a few years before transferring over to Oregon last season, had a pretty good year, decides to return, looking to probably up his draft stock because I think it was kind of probably like a mid-day three pick. And this year, probably, probably going to maybe potentially sneak into day two, maybe in that early day three range, similar to Brandon Dorless, because him and Brandon Dorless have a lot in common because they're these bigger edge players that probably fit better along the interior in the NFL. Because currently, well, Birch is primarily playing on the outside, much like he did last season. And with that frame... I think it's just better suited for the interior. And for one, he's going to get drafted relatively high in the first four rounds because of what he can do as a run defender. Because he's got, honestly, good play strength. One of my biggest critiques with him is the level of physicality he, can, he plays with. And will that trans transition into the interior? Uh, how will that work out? Like, honestly, I look at him and I'm like, man, I feel like he's... Someone you want to play right over top of the tackle or maybe uh, inside four tech. So like kind of like a three, four edge or three, four end, so to speak. But dude plays with good play strength. We've seen it pop. He does a good job of keeping, keeping the pads clean. That's why he's so successful out there on the edge. And he's got the big motor, uh, strong core, good power rusher. And might not have like the quickest step. That's why he can't, I don't think he could play consistently on the outside. But at his size, he is very, very quick. And it's going to be interesting wh where a team may take him. I do feel like third round is a good range for him. I think at least with his play this year, thus far, 21 pressures, uh, five sacks, a uh, pretty solid win rate at about 16%. He's kind of played himself maybe into that back end of day two, but I mean, it's a stacked interior class. And I guess it kind of depends on how you view how he will be used at the next level. But he's someone you got to mention. He's kind of been a, a bit of a riser in honestly a kind of bloated defensive line class. Before we get back to the mock draft, got to give a special thanks to our friends at BetUS. If you go to BetUS right now, and use promo code YouTube150, then you'll get a 150% sign-in bonus on your first deposit. But that ain't it, because your next two deposits will get a 125% sign-in bonus, and that's all up to $2,000. Get in on the action. Bet US, they give you a little extra to play with to help start in your betting journey. Remember, go to Bet US and sign up using promo code YouTube150 if you want to get in on the action it's an absolutely ludicrous deal and i want you to take advantage of that but as always bet responsibly bet within your means at number nine i got the godfather himself dante corleone out of since he coming in at 6'1 320 pounds he's got that nice bowling ball build i just love that but he was initially a three-star recruit from the 2021 class richer his first uh his freshman season they're in Cincinnati and really didn't become like a full-time starter until 2023. I remember watching him during that open, his, like his first start. I think it was against Arkansas. And this is where he went up against Bo Limmer a lot of the times. And I was like, yeah, it looks like he, it looks like Bo Limmer is taking care of somebody who's still trying to figure it out, but he figured it out. Like this year, a lot of the, a lot of the critiques I had from last season He's done a good job of just kind of like getting better at that. Like, uh, I don't think he's playing as out of control. Like that, that kind of was kind of a big thing, man. It felt like he was just going out there and trying to be a bit of a bull in a china shop. And I've had people say they hear that that metaphor and they think it's a good thing. Uh, not necessarily. When you're playing as a bull in a china shop, you're just playing out of control. You find yourself on the ground. And you're not really contributing to the play. You're just going out there creating chaos. And 
that doesn't always work in the NFL. You got to be a bit more disciplined. And I think we've seen that from him this season. And I mean, we'll get to it uh, in a little bit, but he was kind of off to a slow start because he had to miss some time. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But at his size, like, I think he's got good get off, but he's not like the twitchiest and the most su- uh, sudden player. He's not like got that li- twitched up. That's the best way to put it. He's not the most twitched up player, but you don't expect him to be at 320 pounds. His ability to disengage is far better this season uh, with a win rate thus far about 12%. But at the very least, at the very like bare minimum, the uh, his floor, you're getting a very good run defender who eats up a lot of space. But this year, he's made that next jump as a pass rusher, in my opinion. Like a guy that consistently plays with leverage because he's got that kind of lower to lower center of gravity. He's able to do so. Quick get, get off at that size. And he's been able, like maybe it's more of a better of a, a better pass rush plan, a better approach to rush in the passer for him. Now, the red flag with him, because I think his play warrants him to be in potentially on a top 50 discussion, but I have him in this third round range because, uh, well, at the beginning of the year, he was being treated for blood clots. He was out indefinitely. Uh, it was clots in his lungs. Seems like, hey, that's maybe a theme of a past. Again, I'm not too familiar. Like, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what long-term ramifications, but I mean, we saw what I think it was Trey Smith who had the blood clots, uh, him fall to like the sixth round ended up being a big steal. I don't think that would be the case for Corleone because he's very talented. So I think he'll probably go higher than that. Uh, so like maybe third, fourth round, maybe they're just, they just chuck it all together and he ends up being this top 50 pick in a relatively lighter class. When you look at like the offensive talent, And maybe even the corner position feels a little bit lighter, but Corleone, man, doing some great work there at Cincinnati. At number eight, I got TJ Sanders out of South Carolina, part of a very scary defensive line there at South Carolina. Coming in at 6'4", 290 pounds, former three-star recruit from the 2021 recruiting class. And he has essentially been a starter the last two years. Uh, He was used a a bit in the rotation back in 2022, but he has been difficult to stop, along with everyone along that defensive line there at uh, South Carolina, whether it's uh, Kyle Kennard, who I think I might talk about in our uh, edge rankings, or uh, a guy that I'm not going to hit up here, but Tonka Hemingway, his his partner in crime there on the interior, who I think is probably going to be an early day three pick. But with Sanders... Maybe not the most explosive guy. He is a tad undersized, so you're gonna uh, it's gonna be a hard sell when you're not like a super athlete. But he's ridiculously strong, consistently plays with good leverage, and how he sets up the pat like sets up his pass rush moves might be among the best in this class at the interior position because he's got very very sudden movements, whether it's his hands. Uh, whether it's what he does with his footwork, that he's able to catch blockers slipping. And when he does, that's when he strikes. He's really good at that. Like, really, really good. He's good at initiating contact and getting blockers off balance. Like, the movement skills, the motor are pretty darn solid, too. Like, the motor's great. Movement skills, great. Um, Again, not the most explosive guy, but he doesn't really need to be. And with that strength, he's able to hold the point of attack. He's able to anchor down. But can he do that in a stronger, more physical NFL is the question. A lot of people have him in the top 50. He's on like the top 50 looking in for me. It's just, golly, this class is so talented. But uh, Sanders, I think he just made it in my preseason prospect rankings. And I've moved him up a couple of spots uh, since then. Everybody loves the NFL draft, and I know you want to be familiar with every potential prospect that your team may draft, so I got good news for you. My draft guide is available for purchase. It is good throughout the entire draft cycle, and it updates through the season regularly. You'll get my current evals and rankings on hundreds of different players with player backgrounds 
and analytics. It also contains combine and pro day numbers, as well as my notes from the senior and shrine bowl. You can purchase it for a one-time payment of 30 bucks on PayPal Venmo. And now I have the cash app. Follow the link in the description and be sure to include your email because it is a Google spreadsheet. That is how I share it with you. So please don't make me hunt down your email. Just don't do it. Anywho, it's a great purchase and it's a great way to support the channel. At number seven, I got Talik Williams out of Ohio State. Coming in at 6'3", 327 pounds, former four-star recruit from the 2021 recruiting class he was heavily used in the rotation in 2022 became a starter in 2023 where he made second team all big 10 and this year he, he's been a little banged up i think he's only played four games which you could say oh that's why the numbers are are, are low but what he brings to the table is he is big he's light on his feet and he plays with leverage and power he is very disciplined as a run defender, does a good job of keeping gap integrity. Uh, he won't be moved off his assignment. He uses that length to reach and tear down ball carriers and does a good job actually working off of double teams. Like he, I would say he is probably the best run defender in this class. The problem with him is what he does as a pass rusher. He's never been a insanely good pass rusher. And I think part of that is maybe a little bit of lack of explosiveness, which you're going to see at 327. No biggie. He's very sudden. He's lying on his feet. He can make it work. But also, like, he doesn't play with the violence as a pass rusher as you'd expect. Like, if his initial pass rush move doesn't work out, he can't really just, like, snatch and drop, like, snatch and trap uh, blockers. You just don't see that. You just see his pass rush moves just kind of peter out which is reflected in that 5% pass rush win rate. That's just not just not a great part of his game. Now, this doesn't mean that's not something that can improve going to the NFL level. We've seen in the past, like a Derek Brown wasn't the most refined or wasn't even uh, the best pass rusher there at Auburn a few years ago, but he kind of developed into one in the NFL. So if you're... Base floor is, oh, he, he's a guy that can play early downs because he's so good at stopping the run. Work on him as a pass rusher, and maybe that part of his game comes along. That's why you can't – I can't keep him out of the top 50. Uh, and I, I like constantly in mocks, I, he's always someone I come back to. I'm like, I could take that high floor of Talik Williams knowing he's going to be a banger run defender. So it's always something to keep in the back of uh, back of your mind, right? I think at the very least, he's probably a top 40 prospect in this class. And can you imagine how much higher he could go if he really was a dominant pass rusher? <sighs> at number six, I have Texas A&M's Shamar Stewart coming in at 6'6", 290 pounds. He's a former five-star recruit. And <sighs> golly, man. It, he's really showcasing why he was a five-star recruit. Last year, he was a big part of the rotation. This year, he, he is a bit of the main course. Like that defensive line for Texas A&M is really good. Big part of why they've won six, six straight games. And the dude is long. He is powerful. His hands pop, plays with heavy hands. And that length just gives him the ability to stack and shed incredibly well. He's actually pretty darn good against the run. But what he does as a pass rusher is very... And I mean, a very, very, very nice. Very explosive first step. Doesn't surprise me that they play him a bit on the edge. We've seen them do that with guys of his size, like a uh, Jamar Turner. But with Stewart, like he's he's typically playing over top of the tackle, maybe a little four inside tech or just outside of the tackle, maybe more in like a six tech role. But the dude is explosive, plays with a big motor, strong hands, active hands and he gives you at that size some great alignment versatility like he primarily like i said he primarily plays over top of the tackle but he's also played inside quite a bit and there are times where the aggies will just line him up at nose tackle and let him go and just let him go and wreak havoc and he's able to get pressure now he's still developing as a pass rusher like he's expanding that toolbox 
Uh, the hand usage isn't always timed well, and the hand placement isn't always ideal, but you know he has those strong hands. He has those active hands. The dude's movement in the right direction is a bit of a tweener because of how he's, like, where he's being played in the NFL. Like, I don't think he's going to, cons- like, in the NFL, he's not going to consistently play off uh, the edge. He's just not. I just can't see that for him. And uh, does he work on the anchor? Like, there are times where he gets uh, occasionally displaced by down blocks. He's effectively neutralized by double teams in the run game. But uh, I, I get, like, Keon White vibes from him. And we've seen kind of Keon White kind of explode at the beginning of this year for the Patriots. So, Stewart, I think you could probably take with a similar approach. And that's why I list him here as a top 50 prospect. At number five, I got Derek Harmon out of Oregon coming in at six foot five, 310 pounds. We've talked about him quite a bit here on the channel. Got him listed as a top 50 type of prospect. He was formerly a three star recruit from the 2021 recruiting class, spent three years at Michigan State where he was a bit of an elite run defender. And then he goes to Oregon this year and suddenly, uh uh-oh, this man can rush the passer now? Currently has a 17.6% pass rush win rate. Absolutely love it, but he's got good size and great flexibility. Like, he is tall, but he carries his weight so stinking well. He doesn't suffer from leverage problems because of that 6'5 height. He stays low. He gets low and stays low, and you love to see that. Huge motor, plays with very active hands, very good footwork. He keeps his feet moving during engagement and while using his hands independently uh, to work off blockers and kind of that's his bread and butter, right? Because like he's not the most explosive guy. I think I think it's solid, but he doesn't have the most explosive first step. But his bread and butter is those active hands, the footwork, the ability to close on ball carriers. You could just look at the forced fumble he caused, the forced fumble and recovery he caused on Quinshawn Jukins where he, he basically met him right after the handoff and ripped the ball out. It was utterly insane. But being a former elite run defender, like he does play with very good gap discipline and he's able to he's able to work or like work off blockers and put himself in good positions to make plays, but now that he's kind of shed weight, I think he was playing more around 320 over at um Michigan State and you could tell that uh, it's kind of it's kind of messed with his anchor a little bit. He doesn't necessarily keep uh, I don't want to say doesn't necessarily keep his assignment, but like he, he can get moved out of the run game. Like double teams annihilate him uh, in the run game uh, just because he doesn't have that anchor anymore. And I'm I'm kind of curious, like because I, like I feel like the power is still there with him. But in the run game, I feel like he's been a little bit more exploitable this season. Part of that also is missed tackles. Golly, missed freaking tackles. This man will get into the backfield sometimes so quick. Like, say if it's on, like, an outside zone play. He'll get in the backfield so quick that he's just at a bad angle to make a play on a ball carrier just out of their reach. Uh, There was the Boise State game (laughs) where... I think it was like a stretch play, but oh, maybe it wasn't. But like you had one Oregon defender in the process of wrapping up Ash and Genty. Derek Hartman comes in for the kill shot, and all he does is knock Genty to the outside where he breaks it off for a big gain. I can't remember if it ends up going for a touchdown, but probably does. It's Ash and Genty. So it's like, yeah, if you could clear up those missed tackles, that would be nice. But he is doing a good job as a penetrator and wreaking havoc. Now, if he could uh, maybe take better angles once he gets back there, that would be ideal. But the dude's such a smooth mover. He's creating so much havoc as a pass protector that he's shown to be this three down player now that you can't ignore him. Like him going to the back end of the first round is not out of the realm of possibility. Like Derek Harmon was one of those guys that kind of came out of nowhere. Wasn't on my radar to begin with. Then I think I was doing a mock the mock and I saw his name go in like the top 20 or at least around that 20 area. And I was like, I don't even know who this is. I'm going to take a look at him. Saw his pass rush win rate this year. And I was like, okay, I'm going to watch him, watch him. And I was like, golly, dude, this dude is just born to wreak havoc in the backfield. 
At number four, I got Dion Walker out of Kentucky coming in an impressive 6'6", 200, 345 pounds. It was 245. Golly, should be playing on the edge. Funny enough, uh, he ha- he actually has played quite a bit on the edge for Kentucky. It- it's kind of wild. He has this alignment versatility that you can move him around. But the dude's just a massive human being. I believe he is a true junior because, yeah, yeah, because in 2022, he made the All-SEC freshman team. So he's a true junior, former four-star, played basketball in high school, but also played offensive tackle. He's a massive human being. And with that, you're at the very least going to be a big space eater, which the NFL, there's not enough of those guys in the NFL. So that's already a big draw of his. He plays with pretty darn good overwhelming power when he wants to there are times where it's like ah hey where where's the power where's the anchor doesn't necessarily bring the same type of power when he is in the run game needs to be static doesn't really doesn't really show that doesn't really show that this year i think it's been a bit better and i think because of that he's not popping as much off as a pass rusher as he had last season but he's starting to come alive as a pass rusher. Last couple of games, he's been pretty darn good. So don't look at that like 10% win rate and be like, ah, oh, uh, he's just not as good, he's not as consistent as a pass rusher. I think part of that is in his mind, he's trying to play more disciplined. But at that size, very light on his feet, man. Guys at that size should not be able to move with the way he does. And he has got very good movement skills. He's got honestly a decent set. Pass rush moves, deadly chop move, man. And I'm a good, I'm a sucker for a good chop move, man. He just swings his arm around with that, with like a massive wrecking ball. It's just deafening. And also team leader. He is a captain on this squad. So you love that, that he could be this presence in the locker room. At 6'6", he's not going to play with ideal leverage. It, it just is what it is. There are times where he just stands up straight up. Just snap goes. Bam. He's heads hitting the ceiling. So like, hey, kind of is what it is. He makes up for it with the movement skills at that size, but definitely certainly a first round prospect, probably kind of on just on the out. Like he's just on the outside of that top 20 range for me. At number three, I got Walter Nolan out of Ole Miss coming in at six foot four, 305 pounds, another former five-star recruit. And He came in with Shamar Stewart there at Texas A&M, but he transferred after after last season. Now he's with Ole Miss, and he's been wreaking havoc. He has been on a hot streak. He is showing that pass rush upside, and you'll love it. He's currently got a 12.7 pass rush uh, win rate, and he's just got a really good build. He's muscular. You always feel like he could probably put on more pounds just because of how he's built, nice barrel chested, and just good full body uh, strength, powerful frame, continues to drive his legs through contact once he gets to the point of attack. He's violent with his hands, and overall athleticism is like, it's borderline elite for the position. It really is, man. He's got a quick first step. He turns speed into power relatively easy, and he's got the nimbleness to loop around in, in stunts which we've seen a lot more from um, Texas A&M this season. He he plays with a lot of fight. He's got that alignment versatility because he did play quite a bit on the edge last season. More This year, more so, he's playing on the interior. And I think he's playing with, it, with more control, like the contact balance was something I was kind of worried about. Felt like he was on the ground a ton. I think it hasn't really been as apparent the last few games. Again, he's on a hot streak right now. And... He's developing in his game. He's become more polished. There's still a ways to go there. But while he like he's shown a variety of pass rush moves and he's starting to show success in those pass rush moves. That's something last year that I didn't necessarily see that he he just it's like, okay, he's got all these moves, but they're not all working. If his like if his initial rush doesn't work, where he doesn't really have the appropriate hand counters to um just fight against the appropriate secondary moves. I feel like he's a lot cleaner this year and he's winning a lot more. Well, I mean, he is winning a lot more. His uh, win rate's up 5%. So love that. Love to see that. He's already passed his pressure numbers from last season. Uh, He should be in range of 
surpassing his sack numbers from last year, which a little inflated from him playing on the edge, is what it is. But he's starting to show the that five-star caliber and should definitely be in the discussion as a top 20 prospect in this class. At number two, I got Kenneth Grant out of Michigan coming in at 6'3", 339 pounds. And sorry, he's just a freak. He's just a freak. I know he had a slow start. Him and Mason Graham, who I'll talk about in a second, started the year relatively slowly, and they have caught fire. They have caught fire. Now, Grant, former four-star recruit from the 2022 recruiting class, and I, like you go read about him. He used to play offensive guard and defensive line. He was LA, LA Times High School Football Player of the Year. He returned a fumble 50 yards, which shouldn't be surprising. He's kind of got crazy good speed. And I'll talk about that in a second because uh, I'm going to have to pull from that USC game because it, it was just so funny. But he also did track and field as a shot putter and ranked in the top 10 in school history for his shot put. He was a second team all big 10 back in 2023. I imagine he's going to be in the run in for first team this season. The dude is big, but he can move like comes, comes with great size for a nose tackle, great motor. But what impresses me is just how light he is on his feet. The expose explosiveness he plays with and that speed. Like you go to last year, right? And it was a big run by, I think it was a Katon Allen, I think, which not the fastest guy, but still is a running back who's like 100 pounds lighter than Grant. And he was able to chase him down about what? Like 30 yards down the field? Utterly insane. This year uh, in the USC game, I think he recovered a fumble and he was well on his way to taking it across midfield. If not for Woody Marks, the running back, who ends up catching up and stripping it and gave USC a chance to, to win that game. They ultimately didn't win the game, but I think they ended up taking the lead at that point and then before Michigan actually just ran their way down the field. Literally ran. Just constant run. Michigan can't pass the football. But he's got insane athleticism at that size. And he's stupid strong as well. At 339, yeah, you better be. This is a man that can redirect blocks. He can survive double teams. Plays with act active hands. He's got some mean pop in his hands. Surprisingly flexible at that size. Uh, the length is a little bit iffy. So I am a little curious what he's going to measure out at. And honestly, for the most part, this has been something that even last year, like he can eat up double teams, but he doesn't really defeat double teams. Like... Honestly, being able to hold his ground, I think it's fine enough. Uh, being able not to be moved off your spot and still being th this thorn in the run lane, I think is, is very key when, when taking on double teams. But in the passing game, just he's not able to defeat them consistently. But listen, man, Grant, I, if to me, is just a, too special of an athlete at that size to pass up on in a very talented interior class. Last but not least, at number one, I have Mason Graham from Michigan coming in at six foot three, three hundred and twenty pounds. A former four-star recruit from the twenty twenty-two recruiting class, he was uh, played offensive tackle and defensive line in high school. He wrestled in high school and was a two-time Trinity League heavyweight champion at that. So, <laughs> love, 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 love to see it, and. Yeah, he got off to a slow start this year with uh, with Kenneth Grant, who I just talked about. Don't know why I was blanking on his name. Got off to a slow start, but he has been incredibly, incredibly disruptive the last few weeks. And now we're seeing what makes him, honestly, one of the best prospects in this class. The ability to penetrate, the, the, the great leverage, the hands, the active hands, the active motor, the great first step. The, the big motor that he plays with, the versatile body type to be able to play uh, all around the interior. We're seeing it all come to head here. And while, yeah, he could probably still add some uh, pass rush moves, whether that's counter, secondary moves and such, uh, he's still winning, and he's winning pretty darn well. 
you look at that, oh, it's only like 11%. And it's like, well, when you take away the last two, like the first two games of the season, it's a considerably better pass rush win rate. And he, he still comes out of this wide stance. And I feel like it takes a little bit of, little bit of zest off of that first move. But golly, that first move, that first step is still so freaking impressive. And he, he's just been dominant the last month, month and a half. Uh, in college football, deserves to be one of the top prospects in this class. I think he goes high, depending on how people feel about the interior class, because uh, defensive interior is also not a devalued position, but it's not viewed as uh, vital as positions like wide receiver, quarterback, corner, uh, tackle, offensive tackle, uh, edge. So it's like it kind of gets on the back burner, but I think I'd argue he's probably the best defensive line prospect in this class. I'd argue he's probably better better than the offensive line class. I'd ta rather take him rather than uh, any of the other offensive linemen in this class. You could make a case that he should probably go ahead of like a Tetero McMillan, who's kind of started to separate himself from the rest of the wide receiver class. The dude is just special. The dude is just good. He deserves to go real high. But let me know who are some of your favorite defensive interior prospects in this class because there's a lot of names that i didn't mention like i said it's really special i love riley riley mills out of Notre dame i'm a big fan speaking of which howard cross his teammate a little undersized but could have very well uh been included on this list i think joshua farmer from florida state's doing pretty well there's amari thomas shamar turner uh, like there's a lot of names in this class so let me know them in the comment section below where you have them going if you want to check out my other rankings videos i've already done quarterback i've done tight end i'm gonna be doing one every day of the week this week up until saturday because hey those are our watch alongs that's where we spend time together but as always until next time you be easy my friends later